Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark. Today is October 21st, 2015. And, uh, you know, on Wednesdays I normally do interviews, and today I am super excited. Uh, we have one of the best activists of our time on the interview this morning. I'll be interviewing Dana Dernford with the nuclear proctologist. And I'm really excited to hear all the information that he can share with us. I have a ton of questions to ask him. So I'm not going to waste our time. He, I hope that he'll be able to stay with us for the full hour. Um, Dana, are you there on the line with us? I am so. Thank you, Lonnie. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us. And let me give out your website again. It's called the thenuclearproctologist.org. And that is run by Dana Dernford. And Dana, you also have a daily feed, don't you, on YouTube? Right. Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. It's a one-hour live stream. At what time is that? It's 10.30 a.m. Pacific Canada time, British Columbia Canada time. <laughs> For one hour, yeah. British Columbia Canada time. We call it Pacific Standard Time here. <laughs> I know. i, I got to do things backwards. We have to learn here in the States. It's really British Columbia Canada time. Okay, so it's 10.30 in the morning, and it's for an hour where you engage people, and people can actually engage and ask you questions while you're discussing what you've discovered. Right. Uh, good chat room. Chat room's very healthy. Eight, nine hundred comments in a one-hour stream. Wow. We've seen it hit a couple of thousand regularly. Um, just come back off the ocean. It's going to take a little while to build that audience back up again, but we're hard at it. Uh, doing episodes every five days a week right now, we're pretty good. Okay, well, look, one of the things, I, mean, I don't know if everybody who understands this understands the journey that you've taken, but uh, let me kind of summarize it, and then I'd like you to expound on it. Uh, Dana ha has been in, uh, actively engaged in paying attention to the whole harm that Fukushima is doing to the West Coast and to the, to the world, frankly, for quite a long time. He has had his own YouTube channel for a while. And I was following him myself on YouTube. And in the somewhere maybe about a year, a year and a half ago, uh, an idea came up for him to go out and just explore the coast of Canada since he's right there, since our governments are not telling us the truth about what's happened. And he basically has taken it upon himself to put his life at risk and go up and down the coast on several journeys to document the fact that the oceans are, in fact, in dire straits. Um, so, Dana, why don't you explain how you got into that little journey? I mean, these were not just one journey. It was five journeys, correct? Right. 15,000 miles of coastline altogether. That's wow. it. That's documented how many miles. So when did Probably you start the there. first journey? What made you decide to take the first journey? So the first journey, I had started up the nuclear proctologist, and a donation button was there, and I had raised $600. And what I'd done was I rented a 30-foot Zodiac uh, twin motor, and these are the tour guides, uh, like the whale-watching type Zodiacs. And we went up into an old haunt of mine known as Desolation Sound. This is where I had commercially dove. Um, seafood for years, uh, you know, just random parts of the year. Dana, excuse me, but could you explain, this was, I'm not a boat person, I don't know if many people are, but a Zodiac is not like a hard-shelled boat. It's so a Zodiac is what the Coast Guard uses uh, to go rescue people. And so what I have is a 24-foot uh, Kevlar bottom, bulletproof bottom on it. It's a Coast Guard, ex-Coast Guard. And these things are designed to always come back. They're designed for the best ride possible, but they're designed with safety in mind. So even if I had an 80-foot boat and I had a sunk, that 24-foot Zodiac that I was using was the same Zodiac they would have sent out to rescue me in a storm. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very safe, uh, but it's a very tough uh, boat. And, you know, it was appropriate boat to be using because this is an emergency. And... Now, of course, after a couple of expeditions, we ended up putting a cabin on the boat, a very expensive cabin, because of the welders. We couldn't get a proper welder that was committed to finishing the job. And so Costas ran over budget a few thousand more dollars, and to, that's a lot of money, trust me. I, I say it might not sound like I'm, I'm giving it any credibility. but And so that Zodiac manifested into the Expeditions for Life um, and carried us all the way through the entire coastline of Canada from one end to the other end <laughs> repeatedly, extensively. Wow. And we've done up to 160 days without coming back home. 
most of that is on the ocean. A scattered time I was in uh, hotel rooms. But we went right through the winter, and we were determined to look at the whole coastline. Now, originally we went out on the rental Zodiac, and we looked at the coastline per se uh, on, as a tourist. But I was looking for marine life, looking for damage, looking for any observable kind of issues on the coastline. And what I discovered was that everything was missing on our shoreline. And that was an utter shock. But I didn't tell anybody. And what I done was nine more, ex eight more expeditions after that. That in in uh, eight more days of low tides, before okay, I said excuse anything. Excuse me. Let anybody. me stop you here. When you say you didn't see anything, what are you talking about? You didn't see anything. Well, what were under, you expecting? right. So it was low tide, and I had uh, as a ruse took bananas with me and got the operator of the tour boat to bring me in close to the shoreline. And I didn't explain to him what I was really doing. I just told him I wanted to get a picture of a banana on the beach. But that was how I got into the beach close enough to be definitive and get pictures of that beach without raising any kind of – at that time, I wasn't 100 percent sure until we, you know, we went and looked at the coastline. And, and that so, was right after that they said there's no more radiation coming out of Fukushima than you get in a banana, correct? Right. And – uh, it turned out there was nothing left on the shoreline, so I spent another eight days, uh, 200 miles of that coastline before I came out with the original presentation and told people that I, you know, I was concerned that the species were missing. At this time, now, there should be 600 algaes, no matter where I go. Uh, Georgia Strait was where we'd done that first uh, nine days. So Georgia Strait is already heavily studied by institutions all over the planet. There were 600 kelps, algaes, in the tidal pools. And on top of that, there was 78 sea anemone species. The sea anemones, sea anemones come in many bright, beautiful colors in their own species. And so it should have been a very vibrant. And it's the same thing with the 76 species of starfish. And then you have all the mollusks and whelks and snails and shellfish and periwinkles and uh, just the invertebrates and everything else, the habitat. And then this zone, the tidal zones, is a, is a mecca for birds and insects. Now this was all missing, and so wow, and so I I understood that it had something really bad possibly happening here, but I still needed to look at more of the coastline before I would raise that kind of um, issue because that is a fruit to me. I couldn't sleep literally for nine days, and then I was heartbroken, and I, and we done that impromptu pre, um, presentation live streamed it out just for the listeners, but was. You then used as a kind of a documentary, and a lot of people misinterpreted it and wasn't able to get the context out of it because of the way that we were only trying to inform the people that this was the initial result, and, and we do got this is definitely after 200 miles is showing that there, we need to look further, and that was how the expeditions were born out of that, yeah, out of that particular event. And that never changed, of course, as we went along the coastline. All the species are missing. 5,600. Now, in context for everybody, that's what is indigenous. These are the residential creatures that I'm talking about. And there's 4 million species in the Pacific Ocean. But these are the ones that are residential to British Columbia and wow. that are heavily studied. And so there could be no misinterpretations on my side. And so the fact that other people say, no, no, it looks fine, uh, where a lot of people would be swayed by that. Oh, I lived here all my life. It looks like that my whole life. No, it doesn't because the institutions have studied this. And I have dove commercially the entire coastline for 14 years. So I'm very tuned into what goes on there. Well, speaking missing. of you diving, that's really – this is a, <coughs> one of the really compelling parts of uh, your passion about this because you are a disabled person, correct? Right. And so right. you went out there with your wheelchair the first <laughs> – first few visits like the first few I, I lost it overboard yeah so you lost your wheelchair right yeah overboard up in uh, north northern canada in the middle of nowhere by myself in a storm and i didn't know it was gone um i was looking for shelter i caught it in really heavy weather and my wheelchair was gone anyway that forced me to make a decision what was and i almost went home um and i decided that i couldn't that I'm on the boat. I can do everything from the boat. And that changed shortly after. I went and got another Zodiac for the roof of the little Zodiac. A little Zodiac for 10-footer for on the roof and an outboard motor for that in order to make it 
I can get up to the shore, right on the shoreline with this thing and get the actual documentation that I felt I had to have. And that changed the game for me anyway. But once again, it was an amazing amount of extra work. I have to manhandle this Zodiac every day in the water and get it up on the roof of another boat and in the motor and all the equipment. And it's just a stupid amount of work. And I do it willingly and I'm grateful that I had that opportunity to go out there and be the person that because I can't be put grateful that you went because um, if anybody has I would suggest that every single person listening to this radio show go to your website and look at the proctologist.org and go to the Pacific Ocean section and look at the documentation Dana has taken pictures do you have videos because I look at the pictures I right. haven't really explored it because I like you know I'm there and I look at all the pictures and I go to your live feed but the pictures are astounding uh, and Tell the story, yeah. What's really astounding about it is um, one, of, one of the things that, you know, I uh, asked Dana earlier was, do you have pictures of the before the Fukushima thing on your website so we could compare? And this is an interesting thing. Do you want to explain that, Dana, why there's no photos there? This is another way that the nuclear industry controls the information we see. Right. I had a copyright uh, put against me in a disingenuous one of the before pictures and for, I was using for context and uh, of course I had to get a lawyer to sort this out and so I can't take a chance on losing my sight uh, and people should go out and look it up themselves in major institutions, uh, studies and uh, uh, what they look up is species count for British Columbia, Canada pre-Fukushima and there's just endless studies, all the major institutions are always coming to this prestigious 26,000 islands up here and doing studies, and they have been for many, many decades. It's, it's highly researched. And so Berkeley Sound on the other side of Vancouver Island has 1,800 more species than we have right here. And so that's what I mean by the studies have went out and looked at the species and cataloged it, came back years later, cataloged it. Other institutions from other countries have come here and cataloged the species. And so it's heavily studied. We, 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 this is definitive. The numbers I'm using are the actual and these are the numbers that they go by, so I don't use any other numbers. Dana, why do you think that the governments, I mean, did you see any other research boats out there? I mean, this is why you went, correct? Because there's just no one taking, it's kind of like uh, the whole thesis of what John Goffman talks about, the NRC, their whole, the whole thesis of the uh, it, nuclear industry is if they don't see it, it doesn't happen. Right, no observed events have happened, but so essentially, you went out and risked your life because really, how many how many journeys did you take? There's five expeditions altogether, and so what they studied, the studies that showed up from uh, the academic world was based upon the whales and uh, tuna and large large mammals. Now, mammal is different than a fish in many many contexts. And because a mammal, mammal is breathing oxygen from the air, you know, comes up and got a blowhole, so to speak. And whereas a fish is living in that, breathing through the water itself, uh, extrapolating oxygen, so is all the marine invertebrates in the ocean itself. But they had studied uh, these animals were way up the food chain. And so that perplexed me because if you were going to study any kind of uh, environmental uh, event, let alone nuclear, you would go look at the microscopic world and the insects right. and yeah you would look at the most vulnerable part of the environment not the stuff that was at the top of the food chain yeah not the strongest part not the last to be affected right and not that you shouldn't look at them it's just that you wouldn't do that till after so you establish that there was an issue in uh, invertebrates and everything else first then you would say okay we better look at at the adults because they're consuming that stuff but it takes them so long to manifest, whereas it doesn't with the invertebrates and the microscopic world. No. Now, when we say you did five trips, what's the period of time that each trip took? How long did you go out for? They were all different. Uh, it was 200, all I can tell you is about 260 days out of 365 days I was gone away on the ocean. Wow. Uh, like you said, one, month, one trip was uh, five months, 160 days. Excuse wow. me. So... Some trips were eight days. One trip was nine days. Um, the last trip was six weeks, I think it was, the, f the fifth and final expedition. And, uh, you know, the first, the second trip, we had four people, and we traveled for several months. 
extensively in the fall of last year. And uh, that was an enormously expensive and difficult to coordinate motorhomes and extra vehicles and docking. How many people were with you? So there was four of us all together. And so that was, like you say, just to launch that expedition was just a stupid amount of money. But we had to go look. We had to get our foot wet somewhere along the way. Well, and I was wasn't at that time that capable. That was kind of like your learning curve, correct? Like that was. The well, I wasn't even capable to get. I I didn't up to this point. I still hadn't gotten on the boat by myself at all. I hadn't even taken a ride on the boat. Only when I went and got the boat originally, I took it out for a test drive. But I didn't use the boat myself. Everybody else was taking orders of where I wanted them to go and get that information from. So you had three people out there with cameras each and. So we really went about it in, in the right way, every way you can look at it. We've done everything right the whole way, right through to the very end, and including what I've been doing after, was done legitimately and by the books and is accountable. Uh, once again, there was no species to be found anywhere on the coastline. It was a daunting task to document wow. the missing. So instead of documenting the species, we documented the missing species. Right. So totally backwards of what you would expect you were going to well, do. Well, the pictures are, they speak for themselves. The pictures, when you look at, when you go to the proctologist.org website. Now, when we say the proctologist.org, we need the word the in front of it, right? And nuclear. The, the nuclear, nuclear proctologist. The nuclear. Thank you for correcting yeah, me. Nuclearproctologist.org. Right. When you go there, because I've gone to your site many times, Essentially, it's really confounding because you're looking at basically bare rock. Like you look at yeah. it, like okay, so there's pictures of bare rocks. Like I, you know, I'm I from don't... Los Angeles originally, right? So I look at like, hmm, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Which is right. why the question about what did it look like? I did go actually to the Googles, and I <laughs> scanned yeah. the areas where you were to look at the images. I went into Google Images, right. and then I just typed in the areas where you were and. Uh, amazingly enough, I was astounded that people in that area are not up in arms and, you know, spit yeah. nails because yeah. if you look at the pictures before, it was magnificent. The colors, the yellow, Stunning. the red, the orange, the blues, the greens, like just every Stunning. color imaginable along the, this beautiful, magnificent, picturesque coastline. And then you go to the nuclearproctologist.org and you're like, Pictures of bare rocks. Like I would that. starve to death going along that coastline if I was trying to eat out of the tidal pools. I would definitely start. You would never survive, and two people could never survive, let alone one person. Well, if you ate out of those tidal pools, you'd probably end up getting cancer in fifteen to twenty years. That's That's the, no matter what you ate, you would. Yeah, if you ate just one single piece out of there, you would end up in that predicament. But there was nothing. There's nothing there to eat. I need uh, kelp weed and kelp cabbage. Uh, so the which, first the 600, the learning curve, you took four people out. What happened on the next trip? Um, the next trip was by myself. What made you decide to go by yourself? I mean, like, you're... Well, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to run you're the whole just saying, crew. When I had no choice. When did you your wheelchair, Dana? First yeah. trip or second trip? Third trip. So you went out with your wheelchair by yourself on the ocean. Yes, did your friends and family think you were completely a lunatic? Like, really? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty well, I think hard. everybody did, understandably so, uh, and, uh, and including myself. Uh, but I didn't see any other way out of this. We, it's impossible to raise enough money to do this properly, so we had to do it on whatever budget was coming in. And, of course, I was extraordinarily fortunate. Um, you know, people like Elaine and Janet and Fred – who donated so much without them this would have never succeeded uh -huh. and without everybody donating everything they've done but without the big donors constantly pulling us out of a jam true. this could have never happened true yeah. i know i've contributed several hundred dollars right. it's nothing yeah. compared to what you needed like seriously right. and These even now really gave so you some money so that you could actually go out there and document this think of what you know what's astounding to me uh dana is you know, we've had a lot of, uh, I, I don't know, I hate to call them trolls or shills because that's kind of what they want us to call them, but I call them nuclear liars, like they're just apologists. All these people go out there and say, well, he's not a real scientist, and look at all the money, but you know how much the government would spend if they did this? I mean, look at what, uh, what did that guy from Woods Hole, I mean, they spent through millions of dollars 
in the first two or three years on the other side from Massachusetts, telling four or five us, million a trip, yeah. Yeah, but they they spent the first three or four years telling us, "Don't worry about Fukushima; right. it's no problem." And then when the their money ran out and the only money they could get it from was from people who want the truth, then they started jumping ship and going to the other side. Well, maybe there's some radiation out there. At least that's my perception. I don't. The, want the that. way I look at it is that I got more hours as a commercial diver underwater than probably all the scientists in any university combined. Well, let's be clear. These scientists, so-called scientists, are nuclear apologists because really they're out there in the oceans telling us, send us your samples of water. We don't <laughs> want the dirt. We don't want the seaweed. We just but, want the water. Because the dirt and seaweed is where it bioaccumulates, yeah. Right, exactly. As you were say, they want to where it's the least toxic. I mean, even John Goffman explained that in the book Poison Power. The reason that a drinking a, a gallon of contaminated water is less toxic than eating a fish that swims in that same water is because fish bioaccumulate. They, in fact, fish need potassium, so they they see the cesium-137 exactly as potassium, and their bodies magnify potassium, or, yeah, potassium a thousand yeah, times. Calcium, yeah. So, and, and they magnetize the cesium a thousand times. Right. They, it, it goes through the exact same paths. Well, cesium, um, there's a hundred times more strontium-90 uh, for cesium that's made. And so cesium uh, goes into the heart and lungs, um, or the heart, and lungs, but it also goes into your muscles and your organs, and strontium goes into the bones. It acts like calcium and your teeth and stuff like that. And but it also goes in your pelvis and creates uh, mutated stem cell pelvises forever after that. Wow. And so there, some of the inventions for radiation protection are to protect your pelvis because of that known Pacific uh, problem of creating these mutated stem cells, which of course will. You know, but a scientist, uh, some people will say that uh, I'm not a scientist, therefore then what I was doing is not beneficial. But a scientist says it's like a banana and a potato chip walking in the sunshine and getting out well, of Well, that was thing. actually Catherine Higley. And so how can they be? That. Sorry? That was actually Catherine Higley from the University of Oregon, right up the road from me here in uh, Corvallis, Oregon. She's one of the biggest nuclear apologists that we have, and she came up with that theory that because there's natural radiation in a banana, that that's the same thing coming out of Fukushima. Yeah, she 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 is the evilest person imaginable because she has the education, actually knows better. And yes. so to propagate a, a fairy tale like that under the pretenses that is legitimate science is an abomination of well, what science you know, stands for. Even with their logic, even with that logic, this is the thing. We know that our bodies are exposed to natural radiation, and the radiation doesn't cause natural occurring cancers, a small amount, but some. But what we're doing is asking the entire planet to accept a doubling, tripling, or quadrupling, or God knows how many more times the natural radiation level, and expecting our bodies to be able to manage it. I mean, it would be one thing to say, yes, we have this level of radiation naturally occurring, and it causes some mutations, some cancers. But for the nu entire nuclear industry to keep compounding it, not just in small levels, but exponentially expecting the humans and any look at these animals along the coast, Dana, they can't survive. There's nothing down there for them to eat. Well, when it comes to radiation, we have terrorist laws and we have nuclear holding sites. And it's not because it's like a banana or like a potato chip, but because it's very dangerous. Right. And so on one side of their mouth, they'll say, when we're concerned, they'll say it's like a banana potato chip if it's an accident. But if a terrorist might have uh, accidentally or got their hands on some of it, then all of a sudden it's extremely dangerous. And so it's used as a battering ram, as a bludgeoning tool in, in both ways. One, to beat down any opposition to the industry and then by claiming it's like a banana or it's an innocuous and benign. And on the other hand, they need to always raise money for terrorist applications, what they call the security. So they, they tell you the truth where it's very dangerous and that they keep it locked up. And so we don't spend all that money on nuclear waste sites, holding sites and laws because it's like a banana. We spend it because it actually really is an issue. And so the people that do come out, like you used to talk about earlier, these are the lowest forms of life imaginable. They have a degree, they have a Hippocratic oath, 
and they chose to uh, blur that line in every step of every way they can for a profit. And so they're completely disingenuous people, and they deserve whatever comes their way in the future, and none of it. Well, that is exactly right, Dana. You know, that's one of the things that astounds me. If you read anything by the IAEA or the uh, in any of these nuclear agencies, the only thing that they consider is the financial cost. There is never any regard for the life cost, the cost to life on the planet, human life or any other life it is uh, beyond comprehension. That's the shock. But they'll take away 100,000 acres because there's a frog there they've never seen before. But yet they'll put a nuclear plant up alongside of that a few years later and kill everything else there, including that frog, and then still maintain the facade that they're trying to protect the environment. Uh, so it's coming to a head. It can't sustain itself. It's not tenable uh, with this rhetoric. And like we really do got an extinction event playing out in the Pacific Ocean. This is not going to go away. This is not going to get better. This is not going to repeat itself. This is not maybe. This is factual. And we have flushed that out extraordinarily well. There's nobody out there can replicate what we pulled off. I, I can assure everybody that there is no scientist out there capable of following my foot tracks. And we went through the most difficult, most unimaginable, the most exposed places on the entire coast. And these people will not go there. But these are the best spots for life. This is where oxygen is liberated in that environment. It is the host of life. And I like, once again, I spent 14 years as a commercial diver, six hours a day on the ocean floor, you know, I really truly do have a unique perspective and not only that, I have done every industry on both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean commercially, above water and underwater. So I have a very, very, very unique perspective on the marine ecosystem and the environment, the tidal zones. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I come from a community that still has no automobiles right on the ocean. And so I was raised in that environment. I am truly at home in that environment. But once again, I had a serious diving accident, a decompression accident that left me debilitated in a hospital bed for just about 15 years. And I got out of my bed to go do what I'm doing now. So when, you were, when this accident happened, you were still uh, in a hospital bed. Yes, yeah. Wow. For almost all day, each day. I get out of my bed for an hour or two each day, the couple of last couple of years, but not even... Well, um, okay. And what, I mean, honestly, that's a fascinating part of the story that I really wasn't aware of. So you were bedridden until the Fukushima event, like you when you first found the out. The diving uh, accident, yeah. So then what made you, dis I mean, like, at what point did you decide, you know what, screw it, I need to go out there and I'm going to do this. I mean, you've been laying in bed for 15 years. That's extremely risky to put yourself out well, of the water. Well, I didn't go underwater, like we talked about earlier where I had three people on the water. I stayed in uh, the motor home. Yeah, but that, right? that was in the campground. number one, well, right? Well, so I, ha I had to go because I, ha I had no options. And so there was a lot of trepidation about how we were going to get me to point A to point B. And how. And so there was a whole lot done there. I was bringing my electric uh, scooter with me everywhere we went. And so everybody, every time we came to a new spot, everybody would have to take all my stuff out and put it there first so I can be mobile. And so all I considered, well, I had three people to help me the whole time, and he did. And so I, I you know, but I, I started building up uh, tolerance to doing things every day. I was forced to do things all night long. I was uploading pictures while everybody was sleeping at the campgrounds or wherever I could find bandwidth. And so slowly but surely, I started to build up a tolerance. But once I went on the ocean myself, uh, that was the most taxing thing imaginable on my body. Uh, but I was determined to see it through because I knew nobody else would get out there and get well, to that. What made you decide to go by? I mean, like, that's a really incredible I couldn't, I couldn't raise the money to bring other people. So it was just, it's either either you go by yourself. I mean, well, even then, I didn't have enough money. I had to keep raising say, money I'll the whole time. It. I had to raise money the whole time. So I went on a speculation that I can keep it going myself. So but you I, did not I understood. Have the funds before you, when you took off, you did not have the funds to actually come back or complete the task. No, that's right, yeah. Or continue the trip either. I had enough to get there. Wow. I was very fortunate, uh, and wow. you know, like I say earlier, a handful of people made sure that I wasn't going to do without. Wow. But I did. I didn't know that was going to happen, right? So I was always going on. You know, when I got enough in the account to go fuel up and get groceries, I was out 
wherever I was to, I was living on a boat with nothing. That boat was soaking wet that five months, the whole time. I did have a diesel stove on it eventually, but that floor and the walls were covered in moisture that whole trip. Everything was soaking wet that whole trip. And it was a terrible, it was a terrible trip. People need to go to your website and take a look at it because uh, would you say it's a boat? Like, honestly, in my view, it looks like a little floating raft. It's got these big rubber sides. It's not like a hard shell. And it's got, I mean, you it's not comfortable. No, <laughs> soaking wet the whole time because it looks like it was just completely exposed to the weather. Like I followed you on this journey, and I was frankly really dumbfounded that you. He took his dog. You guys, this is the amazing part. His little dog Zoe went with him. She was dry the whole time, though. I kept her dry. <laughs> <laughs> she was the only thing dry in the whole boat. I mean, what a sweet little angel to have. She was. <laughs> you guys were pretty, in my view. That I mean, that took a lot of courage to go up the coast by yourself and i'm astounded to hear that you had been bedridden i thought when you say you were bedridden maybe you were bedridden five or ten fifteen years ago you were bedridden until you went on this journey right wow i only went because i understood that i have a um, have unique skills and i wasn't sure if i can call back up on them but i understood that i really truly I was the right person because I knew the coastline, I knew the tidal pools, I knew this whole thing and everything aspect of what we needed to do. I knew it so well. And what people don't understand about me too is that eight years ago I had a company called Marine Channels Productions Limited and that company was going to put 100 cameras in the ocean for a starter and then feed that on the internet at $5 a month. And so the idea was eventually I would have thousands and thousands of cameras in the ocean of all the different lives focused in on them. And you can't do that anymore because those that's all gone. Oh, you mean you were going to try to make a money-making deal off of the beautiful uh, flora and all the fish and the abundant life off of the coast of Canada? Yeah, uh, that was eight years ago, and I had a thriving company, Marine Channel Productions Limited. Wow. Yeah, and UVic, uh, the same uh, – institution where Jay Cullen, uh, one of our, our enemies, is to, the nuclear apologist, that institution got $300 million and went out and took my business plan, my exact business plan, and done my business plan. And so I went into a big depression for about four years over that. I fought them. I went after them. I contacted everybody that blurped about them. And I said, this is wrong. This is my exact business plan they're using. And because I had to go get leases on shorelines, I had to deal with federal fisheries and forestry management. And so they knew my business plan really well. And so here was UVic with my exact business plan, putting cameras underwater, 3,000 miles of fiber optic cable. That's the exact amount of cable they put out, every aspect of it. So they stole it right out from underneath me. And so I had went into a really, really serious depression for about four years. And then uh, Fukushima happened. Wow. And so I was switching gears at this stage. I had moved on, but I was still depressed that I had lost my, my dream. Wow. That I had manifested that one as a commercial diver looking at the incredible amount of life in this shallow water where the sunlight was penetrating and had worked out this business plan. So I was there already well, you know what I'm saying? I was one of those people who truly did love the ocean. I loved that environment. I have my well, entire life. Well, what about life. the people living there? This is part of the story that I find most fascinating, too. Boiling frogs. The, the yeah. people, as you're traveling, I mean, you went 1,500 miles, correct? 15,000. 15,000 miles? miles? Yeah, all together. That's what we covered, wow. a coastline of Canada. And along the way, you had to have encountered communities up and down the coast, correct? Right. Were any, in, every every community, yeah. In any, were the, any of those communities... Uh, receptive, like, did they say, wow, man, our hat's off to you, thanks for taking a look into this, where, anyway, we Fisheries can... and Oceans, Coast Guard, RCMP have all come up to me and told me that. Uh, communities have told me that. What's RCMP? What's RCMP? That's the police department here in Canada. Oh, wow, uh, really? Which are, which are out on the ocean, right? I've talked to all these people on the ocean, they've all come up to see what I was doing out there. And they all commended me on what I was doing. And wow. were shocked. And they, they, they all knew what the whispers of Fukushima were about. And they were all saying, and they all told me the one same thing um, symmetrically throughout the whole coastline was I was the only person they had ever encountered or even heard about that was physically out there looking. And wow. that 
they they were the only people they were aware of was Jay Cullen and Ken Busler's uh, Busler, and these were fabricating lion sacks of dirt. <laughs> that, excuse me, that have caused us a whole lot of grief by telling people it's like a banana or like a potato chip or like walking in the sunshine. And they don't stop. They do that every day. They do that in every email. They do that in every presentation. They get all the traction across the planet. And But they're not nuclear scientists, so they're both marine chemists. And so the only two people in North America are Ken Buesler and Jay Cullen that are get any traction anywhere. And every time they open their mouth, everybody pukes up whatever they said. That's as, really amazing. Like, let, let me go back to that because that is a particular – Big, big gigantic point of interest here. These people are not nuclear scientists. They are marine right. biologists, right. and they are considered the quote experts now about. Well, they're marine chemists. They're not a marine biologists. They're marine chemists. So a marine biologist would 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 rattle off all the names of the marine species, but a marine chemist would only talk about the chemicals in the water. Totally well, different okay. world. They, don't, they didn't study the marine life okay, itself. Now, you see, this is how insidious these rat bastards are. Yeah. This is why that they can go out there and say, we don't want you to collect the seaweed. We don't want you to collect the dirt where most of the radiation has settled and right. bioaccumulates. Well, we're, they we're more want you to just to take anyway. the water because what? They are chemists and they're only going to study the water. Right. And so why they're out there spending millions of dollars on each trip how come they couldn't get any kelp samples or fish samples or microscopic animals or phytoplankton or, or dirt, plants or krill dirt. or even dirt or even a rock on the beach you know, or something like that? You uh, know, I have a GoFundMe page. We're trying to get them a gamma spectrometer. They're, a, they're out. Uh, that's Mimi German up in uh, Portland. They have a... Uh, they have a radiation detector, and I'm sorry, I don't know the technical name of it. It, sure. does, it does not test for radiation in your food, but it, they ha they were able to pull kelp, I believe, from British Columbia and dirt from Vancouver. Both of them show signatures of Fukushima radiation 137, and that's what got them going like, you know what? We need to start testing our food here. And the gamma spectrometer is expensive. It's like $4,500, $5,000. It's not a cheap piece of equipment. No, a proper one is $50,000. Uh, but you need 2,000 uh, Geiger counters, 2,000 Geiger counters calibrated to each of the isotopes that we know about. There's tens of thousands of them. But there's 2,000 we know about. The rest are classified. And so you need 2,000. Like you say that so quickly. Like I, I want to go back. I know. To, yeah. What do you mean classified? They're classified through military. And so you're, you mean we're on a need-to-know basis, and we don't need to know? Right. And we and, don't need to know about the radiation? Oh, well, Russia might do it, too, or China might take that information and use it some way or another. That's the, that's the, the fear-mongering machine, so they keep it classified, and then they never mention it. But we really only hear about iodine, which has an eight-day half-life in strontium or uh, cesium. But the reactors run on uranium, plutonium, and and these the ones we hear better are the byproducts of the rods cracking, not of the actual elements themselves, right? Well, you know, I remember I called I I forget who it was I called to be honest about a year and a half ago, two years. I called a scientific agency and I said, "Why are we only testing for cesium one thirty seven? Like, why aren't we testing for plutonium?" Or and then you know what the answer was? Well, because we did so much nuclear testing during the 50s and 60s that there's plutonium has uh, these a lot of these isotopes have a long life. So that we, we can't tell when, like if it came from the 50s or 60s, we can't tell when it started. So we can't tell when it. Well, got actually, they can, and so that's another lie to tell you. Oh, they, really? it, each of these isotopes have a distinct signature to them, and they can tell what reactor it was released from. You mean the test. plutonium from Fukushima it would be different, say, than the plutonium from Oyster Creek? Right. That's correct. So they could actually really look at our dirt, look at our water, test right. our food. Like in Portland, Oregon, we could actually yes. find out if the plutonium came from Hanford or from Fukushima. Yes, that's correct. Wow. Uh, and so they have detection networks all over the world and so when North Korea ever has a test that's the first thing they come out and say we identified the isotope and it never came from any other uh, event it, that, that came from North Korea's so it had to come from North Korea uh, but I mean these are just many of the things they allude to in, in that sense 
Now, so, do you go think, ahead, Lonnie. You guys just had a, an election in Canada. Do you think that the change in your government, the so-called liberal government, is going to actually turn its attention to the devastation on the west coast of Canada? We would have voted for uh, Fruit Floyd just to get rid of Stephen Harper. We yeah, would have like elected a piece of orange peel on the side of the road if we thought we could just to get rid of the the current. Uh, yeah, the anybody disgusting. but Bush vote. That's what we did with Obama. Anybody right. but Bush, right? <laughs> and so they put us in this position. They set that stage, and we voted for the banana. You're right. Uh, no, nothing's going to change there. Uh, that's not what they do. They they don't get the job because they're going to change things. We did pull the planes out of Syria, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, once again, you know, we went in the Taliban. After the Taliban in Afghanistan, millions dead, millions missing, millions in refugee camps, millions of orphans wrecked the entire country. They get 10,000 people. Then we went over to Iraq, done the exact same thing. Millions dead, millions missing, right. millions in refugee camps. Well, 10,000 gangbangers now we're in Syria, 7 million refugees. To get whatever was left of the Taliban. I mean, if this is not a hoax, I don't know what is. Right. Well, the whole thing is this is the thing. Uh, you and I were talking earlier about this. Like, I asked you how you got in, you know, like, how did you get into this? Like, what, before, you know, how did you get into this? And you told me you had started studying depleted uranium, which I have a particular interest because I had heard about that. We, you know, the United States uh, Army manual was changed last year against the Geneva Conventions to say that depleted uraniums are now an acceptable form of weaponry that the United States can use and will sell to anybody. Because they're trying to bring in the whole Mises theory. But uh, depleted uranium used to be called dull ram, depleted uranium, low-level radioactive materials. And that this stuff has extra electrons attached to it through the neutron bombardment of the chain reaction. And so now that element doesn't resemble any current element. Say that again, Dana. I'm sorry. I'm slow at this, but say that again. So what happens is we take elements that are natural to this planet and that are the indigenous elements on the planet and the solar system itself, and we put it through a chain reaction. What the chain reaction does, it bombards it with what they call neutrons, and these are like uh, waves, uh, electrical waves, and what happens is it attaches electron to the original element and creates a new element because now it has a new atomic weight. Right. But nothing on the planet has ever encountered this new element, and so it, it rejects it. Excuse me. And so your body, when you encounter your body floods itself with white blood cells like it would with a virus or a pathogen. It'll flood itself with a white blood cell to kill off the virus or the pathogen. But because it's an emitter, it's pumping out this energy. As the white blood cells try to deal with it, it can't because it just eradicates everything around it. It knocks apart your chromosomes and your DNA. But your body keeps attacking it like it would with a virus or a pathogen. And so it floods your body with white blood cells, and that displaces the oxygen in your blood. And that makes people lethargic and lazy. And it also... Uh, triggers autoimmune deficiency problems because of the lack of oxygen. Your body needs oxygen to perform. And so when you get this lack of oxygen, your body uh, re really goes through a whole lot of rejection. But because we can't chelate it out of our body, we can't get it out of our body, sequestered into our muscles and organs and bones, then that means our, weight, our immune system will attack it till the end of time. And so after about 20 years, we turn it into a sarcophagus, into a tumor, which is a sarcophagus that are white blood cells created around it, and then it gets diagnosed as a cancer. But there's 1,800 autoimmune deficiencies that will show up before the cancer for, because of the lack of the oxygen and the attack upon the free radicals in the body. And so that could be diabetes is one of the most notorious ones, Alzheimer's, dementia, cardiovascular problems. And so all of these autoimmune deficiencies that are debilitating or that are problematic are the manifestations of the radioactive material. And we know this because Dr. Raymond Gilmetti uh, from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico, and I don't have it there in front of me, but what he done was he done 95, 94 peer review academic studies on beagle dogs and beagle puppies and other animals, but always beagle and dogs and beagle puppies for 35 years, still doing it in New Mexico. And his, his studies show repeatedly that no matter how small the dose was, it killed the dogs in three or four years. Yes, and well, so, that, that's what Dr. John Goffman showed and Arthur right. Champlin and Linus Pauling in the 50s and 60s when they well, were, we're hired by the about, 
and we're told about fruit flies. And so we have to we have to look at because they won't tell us about those studies, but those studies are real. And what I'm saying, and what you're saying, of course, is that we already have the documentation of how harmful this stuff is. Besides the fact that they won't mention it, we actually have it, and it does exist. But it's not just these people. There's thousands of these other institutions killing animals all day, every day with radiation, and they have never had any doubt it would kill the animal. They just want to figure out how it killed the animal. It has never, that research for 35 years that we know about that loveless has never cured anybody. Right. 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 Uh, so what was the benefit of it? Right. That's I the mean, question I can't showing answer. Over, this is the whole idea behind the hormesis theory. And in fact, the, right. the deadline is November 19th for us to bombard the NRC to tell them we don't want to go to the hormesis theory. So, but in that... Yeah. In their article, the reason they're saying it is because of Fukushima. They're literally saying, we need to go to the hormesis model because Fukushima, because they have no idea what to do. They they have no answers on how, they have spent no money on how to resolve the harm that is being caused by the radiation. Right, they, they don't say, Harvard and Yale, Stanford, Oxford, MIT, all these institutions do not go to Fukushima. The only people that go to Fukushima as I covered many times, of course, are the homeless, the destitute, the marginalized, the victims of society, the immigrants who don't speak the language. And so these people are incompetent, not that they're bad people, but just that they're incompetent in that environment and they create more issues and they do things that shouldn't be done because they don't know the difference, they can't rationalize what they're doing. And so there's an utter betrayal of the industry itself in every step of the way, every aspect and every facet of this conversation we have been betrayed by these industries well even worse than that you know what they're doing here in oregon you know we're getting bombarded on a regular basis here in oregon with the debris from the tsunami five years ago so there's a program here where they're bringing the teenagers from fukushima over here to help clean up it's called uh what's it called some uh memory reunification program or some bullshit acronym right. like that to bring the teenagers over here to help them pick up the the debris. Fukushima debris on the yeah, coastline. Yeah, I mean, like, these are people who have already been exposed. They're young people which are highly more sensitive to the effects of radiation, who have already been bombarded by radiation, coming to the coastline that is already again being bombarded, and they're out there just picking it up and having these sweet, they show these little clips on television, these sweet little memories of these teenagers looking at pieces of, you know, material right. from their homeland. I actually about fell off my chair the first time I saw it. I contacted everybody. I, right I, through Canada, we have people cleaning up the coastline, and they get millions of dollars each year donated to that. But not one community has a Geiger counter, and we had what? Geiger counters. Yeah, we had Geiger counters right throughout the whole coastline as Fukushima happened. They switched them all off. And they never, nobody, only uh, Queen Charlotte's is the only one, John Disney, I call it Disneyland. He got a, a Geiger counter from eBay. It was, you had to bill it yourself. And then he's got it hooked up to a Windows 98 laptop. And so it's it totally dysfunctional on purpose. Now, th the year before that, he had almost $3 million given to him to go out and create a phytoplankton bloom in the Charlotte's. That was in the media, but not about the reason what the real reason why he done that there because the phytoplankton is missing and that's the basis of the food chain oxygen and the carbon sequestering chains but the, up in the charlotte's before i got up there they had spent two over well almost three million dollars trying to create an artificial phytoplankton bloom but the ocean in a glass of water to 75 to 100 million phytoplankton and a billion other creatures in a glass of salt water so why was canada trying to start up an artificial phytoplankton bloom is a question people should be asking well, this is my question. I see we only have about 10 minutes left, so I really want to ask you a few more questions. Okay. When, while you were on your trip up on this journey, these five trips, the people that, I mean, it's probably not a very highly populated <coughs> place. They probably have little villages along the coast. Raining and blowing most of the Yeah, so like when you went into those little to towns you. and checked in there, were people appreciative of you? Did they Were they grateful that you were finally someone was going out there to at least look? I had a lot of humbling moments, yeah. There was a lot of people that had, they heard about Fukushima but didn't know anything about it. And, wow. And once I explained it to them, when they had a chance to talk to me, uh, expressed their gratitude. And that's, look, you see, once again, it's humbling. Uh, 
and same thing with the Coast Guard and Fisheries and RCMP, the police department here. That, and I was stopped repeatedly on the ocean by these people, and they were all humbled and uh, shocked in every sense of the word and uninformed. And, and what, had, what about the Native Americans? Because I saw that one video did, where they were shooting at you. Like, that was outrageous. Right. Yeah, they shot at me three times. And uh, I had to leave that spot, and I never got to finish it, that little spot, which was, I still regret that, but because um, I'm disabled and I'm in a Zodiac, it don't take much to sink me. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, besides that, I mean, you know, you can't argue. Well, most of the Native that. community uh, was very concerned and was aware, and because they live on in that environment, they eat that environment, and so many, many, like Hartley Bay, this little tiny community of about 115 people, uh, Every single person I talked to told me it was impossible to find mussels or shellfish on their coastline and that the birds were gone, the fish were gone, they don't know what's going on, no one's talking to them. They heard about Fukushima and all you find is Ken Buesler and Jay Cullen talking about bananas and potato chips and that it's harmless. And so a lot of, there was a lot of people, but once again, the weather was so bad, it's hard to have an interview or talk to anybody when it's rain, we had storm after storm after storm after storm for five months. That's why I never came home, because I might not make it back, and you probably wouldn't even made it home. So I just stayed there and got the job done anyway. It was it was another reason why I was able to stay there. Uh, I would have stayed anyway, but I would have finished the job if the weather had been good. But, you know, I took an incredible thrashing, and I continue uh, to try to recover from that even now. And once, yeah. like, yeah, even now I'm just starting to get back to who I am. Well, starting five trips, to no, home five trips in that little bit of time. You would come back, rest for a few days, and head back out. Like Yeah, come back, rebuild the operation, raise the money. No, I mean, frankly, I followed your trips, and it, it, you did it, just. it scared me a few times. Like, well, you know, especially especially since you couldn't post videos because you were out on the water, right? So it was kind of like... No internet, no. Lord, we hope you're... I mean, there was a lot of people praying for you. And it was. Yeah, this is really the concerned. astounding part for me more than anything else. After all of these journeys, have you had any government agencies or anybody of a scientific authority or anything reach out to you and say, hey, we want to work together to help get this real story and figure it out because we see the diminishing wildlife out here on the coast no they basically are just, <laughs> i mean i i knew the answer you know the answer but you gotta ask it i know well i mean it's really astounding that the so-called people who care about the environment like for example this guy you know jay collin and uh, the guy from woods hole busler like they act like they are really concerned now that there's radiation yeah. out there. When for the first three years they were like making money, telling everybody, "Don't worry about it." It's You're all pulling in three hundred and sixty thousand a month on samples, and you never find nothing. And if you do, it's harmless. Uh, but once again, you know, it's so difficult to do what I'm doing. It's so difficult to even consider that I'm still trying to move ahead. And trying to raise any kind of money, I haven't raised anything since I got home. Flat broke and. That doesn't bother me, uh, but you know I can't, I can't be competition without some kind of. What are your goals? And let's talk about what it is you'd like to accomplish. What are the things that? You well, I need a twelve thousand dollar tricaster. So What's can, a tricaster? A tricaster is what Fox News or CNN or uh, big media would use to switch back and forth between guest and host and to uh, import in pictures and graphics and. Also, it's an Adobe kind of type uh, sound system instantly. So if you were to call me up on a old cell phone, I could take that in real time, put it through the Adobe system, and your voice would come out like mine is right now, okay. really, really rich and everything. Also, people can get all the nuances. But it's it's a machine that allows me also to make the documentaries and produce movies and everything else. I and see. anything Hollywood could do, I can do yeah. too with the TriCaster. It's it's a they say it's about democratizing um, movie making, and it is. It has all the features. Mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. So it's so that you can put together all these thousands, so I can continue and thousands, to do what I'm doing, thousands yeah. of reels together and make some, some comprehensive. And, and so that I can have five people in the conversation and seamlessly integrate that. And, I mean, this TriCaster will stream out to three live streams at the same time. It will chop the video up after and post it up there at other sites all automatically with the tags. 
okay. and it'll go to social networking and post links saying the video is right here. And so it is, uh, it's like having a whole team helping you all day, and I have to do everything myself all the time. And I'm still worn out. I'm still in my hospital bed all day now that I'm back. Yeah. I, haven't, I rarely get out of my hospital bed anymore just for my live streams that I'm doing, and then I'm back into my bed. Right. I'm well, I mean, we're also fighting the effects of the radiation. We're on the West Coast. I know the lethargy has really affected me. So that's one piece of equipment. Is that the major piece of equipment that you want? Is there? More? Yeah, and with that, I need fifteen hundred dollars in lights, and I need all kinds of, uh, you know, five hundred dollars, three or four five hundred dollar cameras, and then the microphones are expensive, and so it's a daunting task for someone like me to try to. To pull together an operation and like that. And build a studio. Essentially, what you want to do is build a studio so that but I will. you can devote this to full time so that you can actually do a really. You've got no choice. Your right. live stream is actually really excellent with a little bit of a shoestring thing that you've done. Right. Yeah, it's pretty it's good. It's very compelling. If nobody's been to Dana's green live stream, my green screen helps because I import everything as I talk. Go ahead. Well, well, look, we have about two minutes left. That's why I apologize for cutting you off, but I want to make sure I get this in. You bet. Uh, Dana Dernford uh, runs a YouTube site called Beautiful Girl by Dana. He has a live stream at 10.30 every morning, and he provides really excellent information and clips of things that have been lost and buried, things that I haven't seen. You also are a regular guest on the Jeff Rentz show, correct? Right. And then you also told me that you have a new interview with, who is that? Oh, um, uh couple hours time with Richie Allen yes love in UK. Richie Allen I don't know if many of you know Richie Allen but he is actually one of the I believe he's with to the David Ike.com I guess he was sponsored but he's actually one of the best interviewers I find out there I, I really look forward to that and Rance's show is always really great too I mean I really know she's not so yeah he's awesome you know I just appreciate the fact that you're out there Dana so, look, we have 10 seconds left. I really want to thank you for being here and really for all the great work. I hope that you can come back and join us again and we can get through the rest of this. I can, so you call me anytime, Lonnie. You know that. <laughs>